Thank you, Sue, for the housekeeping and for elaborating on why we are here tonight. And again, when you talk about cochlear implants, you're talking about families, you're talking about parents, you're basically talking about me. Next slide, please. And you can play the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Elaine Gesha Sasabe Rukaya. I'm a brand new 16 year old, and as far as I know, I'm the first child cooking franchise in Uganda. My dad has asked me for permission to share my story at the CIICA, but as I don't know what it is, I'll let him share because he has always had great attention for me. I pray you be blessed with it. Bye bye. Right. Thank you. Um, again. Hello, everyone. Elaine. Previous slide. Without the video. Yes. Elaine is the reason why I'm here tonight, but she's also the motivation for me to do what I do in Uganda and also elsewhere. When we are talking about cochlear implants, when we are talking about children, we are actually talking about real life experiences. We are talking about families. We are talking about real people. We are not talking about data. We are talking about a life that has been transformed. Just like you had Elaine, from a child, she is now a brand new 16. She made 16 um, on, uh, on 15th, this, on 13th this month. And when she was a child, she suffered hearing loss. And uh, opportunities for her just crushed in front of her. Without the intervention of a cochlear implant, she would not be speaking to us like it is now. Next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about how do we get funding. And in Uganda, it's, it's a different thing. So next slide, please. When I talk about cochlear implants, in the absence of um, government funding, it is a hard option for many families. Who would otherwise benefit from it, like me and our Elaine? Therefore, parents need adequate information to be able to perform a thorough cost-benefit analysis for this gen of cochlear implants. They need general information on hearing loss so that they can be able to understand the diagnosis. They need information on audiology. They need information on speech and language. They need information in rehabilitation. They need re information in education options as well. Now you'll ask me why. It's because it is said that 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. This information, when you don't have any information about hearing loss, this information of diagnosis is overwhelming. It rises up the emotions. The stakes are high at that time. And once the emotions are high, you will know that cognition is low. Therefore, Parents also need time. They need time to be able to synthesize information for better decision-making. Better decision-making about funding, better decision-making about different options, better decision-making about what is going to happen to their children or to their child. When I talk about cochlear implants in developing and middle-income countries, it is actually on the lowest option because of the costs involved. Funding becomes really hard, but when you look at the whole child, this is possible, it's doable, if they really get all the information they need. So funding can happen, especially for the initial cost. It can happen through fundraising, through charities, um, through crowd funding. Uh, other families put up harambees, they do car washing, 
But I call this friend raising because you need a friend who is going to work with you to be able to hold your back, pat your shoulders, and be able to look at these millions that are being asked for an intervention. Take a case in Uganda. The initial cost is actually accelerated by indirect costs of almost 36%. And this indirect cost comes in as taxes. So you're going to pay taxes on uh, VAT. You're going to pay taxes in terms of import duty. You're going to pay taxes in terms of infrastructure. And the numbers are here on the slide, on my slide. It, now, all, all these just beef up the cost of cochlear implants. And it comes to, to be out of reach for many families in developing countries. But after our journey uh, to the World Health Organization with my daughter, um, we engaged the government in 2017. And our goal was, if the government is thinking about making hearing technology accessible to Ugandans, then we must think about how to reduce the cost of cochlear implants. There are costs that can be justifiable, uh, direct medical costs and the indirect medical cost. But for the indirect cost in terms of taxes, this is what the government could be able to do. So next slide, please. So through various engagements, we were able to get the government waive all the taxes, 36% taken off, and that lowers the initial cost of cochlear implants in Uganda. And we have worked to be able to start, actually pioneer, early and intervention services in Uganda. Why? We actually call it early, but it's simply timely because how early is early? Without access, I know Paige is going to be talking about uh, this later on, but without access to uh, newborn screening, without access to early diagnosis, early comes much later in life. So it ceases to be early. It becomes now timely intervention. We need timely intervention. So we need programs that are going to help us bridge the gap. Why timely? Because for us to be advocating for better services in the country, we need good numbers. We need to be able to tell the government with evidence that these numbers are actually working. So we also work hand in hand with uh, the parents to support them so that they are the mouthpiece of their children who can't be able to, to, to communicate or talk. And as we do that, we also engaged in research and advocacy. And again, this is for evidence-based advocacy. The, this came in so handy because when we reached out to, to the government uh, through the Ministry of Health, actually we went and sat with the permanent secretary in her office. Um, she tells of this story when she was listening to the, to the parents who were in this meeting. She actually could not hold back but make an action. Uh, and engaging the, 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 the health committee in parliament, the parliamentary health committee, it requires data. You need to tell people, you know, World Health Organization has a lot of data, but what is happening locally is very important. And this is what is going to move the policy makers. This is what is going to move the decision makers to be able to act in favor of um, your advocacy. But we also look at how can we strengthen the infrastructure without systems in place. The, uh, the cochlear implants becomes a challenge. So you need systems and protocols in place so that from diagnosis to implantation, that whole journey and even aftercare is taken place, all this in a system, in a systematic way. Next slide, please. So where are we? in Uganda today. Um, 
this is a repetition of sorts, but um, we have worked again, I always say that um, taking care of children with hearing loss takes a global village. Initially, you know, we are working in global villages right now. It is said that to raise up a child, it requires a, a village, but to raise up a child with hearing loss or any other uh, disability, it requires a global village. So through different networks, uh, like our network with um, former EA Foundation, uh, with Cochlear Corporation, we were able to train parents and this information empowering parents. Um, the best way, and again, for manufacturers, the best way to, to have uh, cochlear implants into communities is to empower the cochlear implant users. They can be the best ambassadors of the product not necessarily so many things that we do. So that, that is important, including empowering families that they can be able to, to get good results out of their children because you can implant a child, but if the family is not at par, the results will not come to pass. The waiver of taxes, like I said, comes in so handy. And working with the different uh, um, uh, referral hospitals, ru uh, regional referral hospitals. We see that there are more services for the ENTs in the different referral hospitals and more people are slowly by slowly getting to proclaim plus. I will say this, I know we are stressed of time, that last week for the first time in Uganda, one, host, one public hospital advertised a job and actually interviewed an audiologist this is the first time an audiologist is going to be employed in a hospital. So small by small strides, there is impact taking place. Next slide, please. All right. I will take this over to Brian. If there are any questions for me within the next one minute, and uh, we will be hey, able yeah. to... Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. And I know one thing that really interests a lot of us is the huge success you've had in actually getting the government to do things like take the tax off VAT and some of the other things they did. Could you just say very briefly, what was the crucial bit of evidence? Because you said evidence was really important. What for you was the crucial bit of evidence that made the difference? Um, there were two documents that were actually handed over to the Minister of Health and the Parliament. Um, by then, it was uh, the report on hearing, the one that came out in 2017. There was evidence, uh, there was a lot of evidence there. But also, Uganda is a signature to World Health Organization. And we, are, Uganda as a country, was mandated to make these things available for her citizens. So we argued along those lines, and indeed, these people know these things. But when it came to how there was a report which was done by Action Aid uh, that, that said that um, children with hearing loss are always falling out of school, and this was evidence based. Uh, many deaf children don't go to school. And again, that cost of um, of, how, of taking care of a person who is not productive for the rest of the rest vis-a-vis -vis investing once and you somebody becomes independent. So those were major dis, um, reasons that we base our discussion. Hey, brilliant. Thank you very much.